All right. Hi, um, my name is Ian Kropp, and um, along with uh, uh, the folks at the Midwest Cover Crop Council and my fellow lab mates here at the MSU Decision Support Lab, um, Bob, Bob Xaravi and Dr. Uh, Najat Hashimi, we uh, are happy to present a new uh, Cover Crop uh, Council decision tool. So um, I think the tool will speak better for its uh, uh, speak for itself. So I'm going to do a demo of it. All right. So let me pull that up. There it is. Alrighty. All right. Can you see the decision tool or do you see the PowerPoint? We are seeing Firefox. Okay, awesome. All right, so this is the uh, new decision tool. Um, so first off, the interface was redesigned to be more uh, to guide folks along the decision uh, pro decision making process, which cover crop for their farm. Um, so the first step is to uh, let the tool know your location. So basically, but, Ian, I'm not seeing the tool. Oh, okay. Just, uh, I'm just seeing just Firefox. Firefox. Oh, interesting. There you go. We got it. Oh, weird. <laughs> so you see, you see the cover crop tool now. Yep. Okay. Sure. We'll go with that. Okay. Let me um, try to reconfigure this. I'm looking at the wrong screen. Share application. All right, how's that? That's good. Awesome. Now I can look at the camera too. All right, so um, as I said, uh, the tool is kind of redesigned to kind of walk the user through the decision making process of choosing a cover crop. Um, and so obviously, location is the most significant. So you basically start off with uh, specifying where you're at, so which state or province that is in, and then uh, which county. Oh, I'm in Kent County, so it's like that. And uh, basically, um, right off the bat, you can see what cover crops are available. Um, they're sorted alphabetically, um, as you can see, but there's other sorting options I'll jump into. And uh, with the hopes of making this as interactive um, as in informational as possible while still keeping it clean, we added a lot of hovering over features. So if you hover over any of the growing periods, um, you can see the exact dates that they're referring to. So you can see that this, uh, uh, this growing period is between August 30th and October 7th, for example. Um, and if you see like an icon that you're curious about, you, you hover over it, and it'll say what, give a little quick blurb. So um, basically, red clover is a, a suitable crop for uh, frost seeding. Um, another example of an icon a bit of information you can get from here, um, you can see when the fly free date is for certain crops, and so on. So basically, it's really an interactive tool that you can play around with and learn from. However, this is kind of the vanilla results that you can get, or the plain results. Um, and if you want to revise your requirements, which you'll likely need to do, you, there's a, a little button up here that pops up. It says require, revise your requirements. So if you click on that, you can go up to the, it'll take you back up to the top of the form where you can add more, um, add more uh, information about your situation. Um, so basically, um, the cover crop tool, as you revise things, it kind of helps you do an iterative process of uh, improving the res your results. So say if you change the county you're looking at, this button will pop up on the bottom for you to go down and uh, see the results that you've uh, been given, basically. Um, and then uh, and a big uh, uh, difference um, from the original tool is that um, this ranking mechanism. So either by default, it's alphabetical. Um, you can also rank them by cover crop type, like the original tool. 
So you can see here, it's uh, grouping the grasses up on top, legumes, brassicas, broadleaves, and mixes. Um, so that's um, one way of grouping them. So go back to alphabetical. Um, alternatively, you can add a goal. So you can add the goal that you want to um, uh, you want from your crops. So say you source, and automatically it'll rank all of the cover crops based on um, their fulfillment of that goal. And if you again, if you hover over the results, you can see there's like a blurb. So it says red clover is great for is a can be. Uh, uh, be uh, used as a or it can be frost seeded, and also it's ranked number four uh, for a nitrogen source, which is up here ranked as excellent. And as you go down, you can see all of the different rankings of the given cover crops. Um, and you can add a second goal to do a secondary sort. So the primary goal will be the first uh, sorting round, um, and the second goal will be a tiebreaker between the first goals. So say I want, um, uh, let's say, uh, erosion control, where is that? Uh, there we go, right. So the tie breaks between the different cover crops are now broken by that second goal. And then after that, it's alphabetical. So it kind of cascades down. So you can kind of see the trade-offs here um, as you are getting more or as you're giving more information about your cover crop. Um, and basically, again, you get more blurbs about why those rankings are made. Um, and even if you want to group it further, you can still group by cover crop type, like the original one. So you can still rank by grasses. So if you rank by type, it'll first rank by type, then by goal, just like the original tool. Um, so you can do all sorts of uh, customization of how you want that data displayed. All right. Uh, so similar to the original tool, select a uh, cash crop you want. So let's say, uh, just throwing something out here, if you wanted to, if you anticipate planting uh, corn between or having corn growing in your field between the 15th of May and say early August, um, you can see that this area, is, there's a little helpful uh, graying out of the schedule because you won't be able to grow any, uh, any cover crops in those periods. And so you can see that um, which, to, which um, cover crops are now appropriate uh, for a uh, given cash crop. All right, and, um, alter and additionally, you can add uh, information about your drainage situation. So say you have a poorly drained field, um, you can see uh, interactively how um, the rankings are affected. So if you go down to the bottom, you can see that there's a group of cover crops that are have a big red arrow next to them. And according to the little pop-up, it says that alfalfa is not, is not suitable for these drainage conditions. So all of these periods are grayed out uh, because they're not recommended by the cover crop decision tool as cover crops under these drainage conditions. Um, however, if you want to, um, if you're considering installing tile in your field, you can turn on tiling and then see how that would reasonably affect your um, prospects. So you can see that tiling was actually in a very effective way of uh, broadening your cover crop options. So, um, and you can toggle and play around with that and compare and contrast and whatnot. Um, that's the bulk of it. Um, the, uh, you can still see the info sheets right here. If you click on the links and get custom information uh, about the uh, situation you're given. So you can see nitrogen source, erosion fighter, all different pros and cons of these uh, cover crops. Um, and you can additionally print this all out on, at your house to pin up, et cetera. All right. Um, and I want to do one additional um, explanation of an improvement of features in the back end of the tool. Um, and to do that, I'm going to do 
uh, presenting um, the. Give me a moment. I'm going to pull up the PowerPoint again. We did have one question come in um, related sure. to the goals and where they're ranked or how, how we get those rankings. So whatever goal you select um, as your first goal, that will be the ranking that's uh, first listed. And, yes. Um, it'll go through the most suitable to least suitable. Um, so those ranked numbers are, are based on the goals that you choose. Uh, exactly. I, yeah, that's exactly how it works. Any other questions for, before we go forward? Yeah, I, I've got a quick question. Um, the the cash crop selection, the only, um, does, it, does it do any more data sort other than planting date and harvest date? I can't, Dean might be able to answer that. Uh, I mean, is there any other considerations, whether it's corn or soybeans, or is it just triggered to the planting and harvest date? It's just, uh, it just gives you the planting and that, that, okay. gray, that gray bar. We have not yeah. actually used the cash crop as far as, as um, ranking, like what cover crops could be, yeah. would be more appropriate uh, with that cash crop now. That's something that could be considered in the future. And I think part of what we want to use um, this webinar for is, is to, you know, get some ideas from people and things that, that they might like to see in the future. So that would require the state teams to create that, that type of a ranking, but that would, I'm guessing that's something that would be quite possible, wouldn't you say, Ian? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, we could, uh, for example, if uh, you have a, you, you can all see my Firefox, right? Yep. Okay. Um, let's say if you have something that's a little bit a more restrictive cash crop growing period, so say August to late August or something like that. Oh, well, give me a moment. So it's plausible that you could rank uh, or you could um, filter out uh, in uh, implausible cover crops from this growing period. So we could, we could bring this one down to the bottom because no one's ever gonna be able to plant these cover crops because they're during the growing period. So yeah, that's, that's a plausible uh, future improvement. That sounds very nice. Yeah, and the, the other thing we want people to understand is that, that you know, if they do wanna use a cover crop during that period that they're gonna have to either aerial seeded or mm -hmm. use some type of interseeding or like that. So I don't think we would want to eliminate them from the list um, if they fall in that period, because there are some methods that would allow you to use cover crops. That's true. Yeah. In that very, during that period. So yeah. um, that's just to kind of let you know, if you're looking for, if there's something you really want to use, you may have to come up with an alternative planting method than after harvest to to uh, use that cover crop, but it could also be something where um, we could rank the most um, popular or the the easiest to manage cover crops within each crop or something like that would be would be a possibility as well. And uh, Vicki asked about the interseeding option. That is one of our goals. Um, as you go through this selection, and that's mostly um, for late overseeding, so a, a pre-harvest seeding. Um, if you go to the information sheet where you click on the cover crop name in that chart, um, you can see a lot more information, and a lot of times there are some comments related to interseeding or overseeding and other concerns that you might have. So. I encourage everyone to check out those information sheets. Um, our partners and collaborators spend a lot of time reviewing comments and uh, going through all this information. So check out those info sheets and um, you can use the goals to help you select some cover crops that may be more suited for interseeding. Cool, awesome. Uh, there was, uh, so one more, let me give me a moment, share. Screen. 
too. All right. And then um, I had another comment come in. Um, Ian, you don't need to switch back to the tool, but the comment is that you can't select a current cash crop planting or harvest date outside of the current year. Um, and that is a limitation of the tool. So as we said before, um, the cash crop is really just meant to be a reminder that you have a cash crop growing in the field. And so um, unfortunately that makes it a little difficult to do things like winter wheat um, or to do a, a more extensive um, crop rotation plan. Uh, but it, it does just put that kind of shadow box over the, over the seeding period. Um, and that is another thing that, you know, we're kind of looking at, you know, how can we make that better and maybe improve on it in the future. So hopefully that answers your question there, Bill. Cool. Uh, are you all seeing uh, the PowerPoint, not the presenter mode? Yes. Awesome. Yes. Cool. Um, one uh, additional kind of uh, behind the scenes feature um, is how the cover crop growing uh, planting periods are being defined and what are we're capable of making right now. So the old method of uh, defining the growing periods uh, had some limitations. So essentially what, um, how it worked was we'd have a, a set of different periods between the frost freeze dates. So we'd have uh, these three in the front are the th spring frost freeze dates. Um, and then over here we have the uh, fall frost freeze dates. And then in between it, we'd have the growing period divided up. And so we basically have 12 buckets of when um, you can have a, a reliable establishment or fris a frost, a frost risk. Um, and then this data is uh, basically uh, see as as populated uh, for each state, and then all of the different uh, frost freeze uh, dates for the different counties would help render the um, what the user eventually sees on the front page. So essentially, how these growing bars so basically we're limited to twelve predefined buckets, and we can't. It was difficult to put in um, more precise days than um, within that resolution of 12 in the entire growing season. And so basically what uh, the, the Cover Crop Council historically has done is to find these buckets, look at the different counties um, in the state, and then see how plausible um, those all make sense for in that case, in those cases, and then you tweak it, and so that's how you get the cycle. So um, I'm going to show you the new method of doing this. Pop out of my screen here and pull it up. Give me a moment. Oops. All right, everyone can see my uh, Safari page. Yep. yep. Anyone there? I'm not hearing anybody. It was on your yep. uh, admin page and now it's... Uh, okay, there it is. Yeah. awesome. Okay, just making sure. Um, okay, so how it works currently is Basically, we select a state that um, we want to work with. We select a cover crop. So let's say uh, winter wheat. And, and then um, basically, let's just pick, pick a better example. Alfalfa. I find one with more than one. Here we go. So how we define it now is we select a reference county. So we say we have an extension 
a worker who has is an expert in um, Ingham County who knows a lot about Italian ryegrass. So basically, this user will go in and uh, say what the proper um, planting periods are for um, that particular uh, for that particular cover crop. So we can define exact dates based off of this empirical data or or whatever whatever ex expert data we have, and then the uh, frost freeze periods will interpolate all of that uh, for all the different counties. So basically, we're able to seed the database with exact data, which will then be interpolated or kind of stretched for to suit all of the different counties um, in a state. So this gives us a lot of more flexibility and a lot more precision. We're not uh, limited to 12 buckets, if you will, and we're really limit, non, unlimited to whatever day of the growing season we want to work with. So will uh, it ever cross over to a different state, this information? For example, if you're taking uh, St. Joe's County in Michigan, mm -hmm. you're, close, you're close down to um, Indiana. So would it ever stretch over to that, or is it strictly confined to the state borders? As now it's the state borders. Yeah. Um, well, it's actually by county. So it's down to county border. It's so whatever the, the frost dates for each county are defined. And so that that translation is, you know, within each specific county. So, yeah, um, thanks, Dean. Uh, so basically the, the benefit of this is we can do, um, we have way more flexibility, way more accuracy than we had before in defining the growing periods, and we're not limited to uh, the low resolution um, options we had earlier. So that's uh, we're pretty pleased about that. Um, We've got a question here about what yeah. temperatures are used for the frost uh, Free of, of freeze dates, and um, I can do that one. We we use the thirty year frost probability data that NOAA puts together, um, for basically for the U.S. but we use the counties, um, or we use the states and counties uh, within the Midwest, and we also had that same uh, data set replicated for Ontario. And so the the underlying temperatures are the it basically uses the um, ten percent the ten percent chance of getting a frost, fifty percent chance, and the um, ninety percent chance of getting a frost um, dates as defined from that thirty year data set. And that's both in the spring and in the fall. So that's that's the hard temperature data that, that we use to do this. And it's a 28 degree frost, right, Dean? Right. It's 28 degree frost data. They generate those tables for 28, 30, 32, and 34, if I remember right. And we use 28 because uh, most of these plants require a hard frost. Question um, with cl with climate change, I mean, how are are has there been was there any discussion as to, for example, maybe take the last ten years and go with that? Because I know this year in Ingham County and uh, Clinton County we had a hard frost three days before fall started. Oh, vegetable farmers were devastated or are devastated, shall I say? So I mean, if these events continue. To happen, we're going to have to figure out a way, I think, to be more um, more current. Um, well, I granted you can't take yeah. just one year, but if you take the last ten years or something, I don't know. So, so the next ten year, the next thirty year period um, uh, is ending in twenty twenty. So they will redo the whole thirty year data set. Um, part of the problem is that they don't create that data set on the last 10 years of data. That, that's a product 
that is created by by NOAA, a general product. Um, and so we don't actually have access to the to the underlying data or the methodology by which they create those those probabilities. It would be something that if we wanted to do that, um, we would have to we would have to request that. And I, I don't I guess before we even did that, we'd have to have some discussions with someone a lot more knowledgeable than me about um, the validity of the last 10 years. Is that gonna skew us in the other direction? Okay, makes sense. So maybe, maybe we could talk to our meteorologist. Yeah. I mean, I think he would be a good resource to tap into as to what he thinks. Yeah. Um, and kind of related to your question, Vicki, about um, information going across state borders, I think it'd be a good time to discuss kind of how we come up with these recommendations, all the ratings for the cover crops, and all that information in the um, information sheet. Um, Dean, do you want to kind of start with the history of how we got to where we are now? Uh, yeah. So. Um, when the Midwest Cover Crop Council decided um, to take on this endeavor, um, what we realized at that point in time that there's a lot of good information out there, but it was um, more um, countrywide in scope. Things like the uh, Managing Cover Crops Profitably book. Um, it, you'd probably recognize a lot of the categories that we used are from the tables in that book. That was kind of our starting point for something that had been developed. And um, the, there's a lot of good information in there, but it was really hard to, to weed it down to your local level. So the idea was to take that and bring it down to um, a, at least a statewide level as far as the rankings and those types of things for the different cover crops and then bring the planting periods down to um, a county a county level. So that was our starting point. And um, to do that, um, it was interesting when we started, people thought, you know, all this information exists, this should be no problem. We just have to pull the right information and boom, we got it and uh, come to find out that no, not a lot of that information did exist for all the different cover crops that we wanted to use in all the, the different states and provinces. So um, we decided to do this with the um, state cover crop uh, resources and experts. And we basically convened a team of those to generate this data for every uh, for this every state and uh, for Ontario um, that was the the best way uh, that we could see to do that because for a lot of these cover crops there was not a lot of research data um, and so we provided resources and references to to research and bulletins and articles and those types of things where where we have them um, but in a lot of cases, this is expert consensus uh, within the state as far as um, what the ratings are and, and uh, the information about about each cover crop within that state. Did that cover it? I think so. I see we've got an interesting comment in the chat box. Is it possible to customize these to other sites? For example, North Yorkshire in the UK. Are we able to modify this for local conditions? Um, yeah, anything's possible. It's whether the, um, you know, probably the one piece of this that is specific to the US would be um, the temperature data, not every, you know, other countries don't necessarily um, put together that type of information. We actually had to have that created uh, for Ontario. 
Um, but as far as the uh, rest of the rest of the tool, um, yeah, it it would be possible for someone to take that and and uh, develop the information and implement it somewhere else. Other regional councils across the U.S. have um, taken our tool and tried to adapt it to their climate and um, some of their specific concerns. Um, so it's possible, but uh, being a tool that's largely based on expert opinion, I think it's um, more difficult because you need experts from your area. Do you have any other questions? Um, Ian, is it possible to show them um, what it looks like on the uh, mobile version? Can you show that with your uh, convert to that display on the computer and, and give them a feel for that? You're muted, Ian. Yeah, give me, I, I can do that. Just give me one moment. Yeah, just and that just so the group knows that was the other motivation for um, for, for uh, doing this this uh, rework of the tool. Um, if any of you ever tried to use the other tool on a cell phone, um, that was quite a challenge. <laughs> and, uh, so. Uh, we uh, that was something we wanted to accomplish with this was to make it more user friendly on on uh, smaller smaller devices and uh, also to uh, for make it also more uh, ADA compatible. Close that out. And Paul Ian pulling that up, I will mention that um, with. This revision, we've added North and South Dakota. Uh, so they weren't available on the old tool, but we have them now. And we've also uh, revised the information in the tool for six other states. So that includes Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, Illinois, Minnesota, and Iowa. Very cool. Okay, uh, this is uh, what the, well, I'll go through first the tablet version and then the mobile version. So this is, um, this is, I'm in Chrome, but this is simulating what an iPad would look like if you're using Chrome on an iPad. Um, so a lot of the design decisions that went into this uh, were based on designing it for all platforms. So this revise your requirements button was really uh, inspired by the mobile experience. Uh, since you have like limited um, real screen real estate, Hold on. basically we want to be able to, there we go, see. Uh, so like if you update something, you can easily click down and flip down and everything else works exactly the same. It's identical tool, just a little bit uh, a little bit altered. So instead of uh, hovering over things, you just click on things. Um, basically, everything is the same, and you click instead of hovering more often. Now let's uh, take it to let's do the mobile version and see how this would look on an iPhone, for example. Let's see, an iPhone 5, a little bit more of a smaller one. Wrong URL. Force it, have it. All right, so this is what it would look like on a mobile browser. Again, everything's exactly the same, except for it's just optimized for a phone. So everything's stacked up instead of being, say, uh, horizontal, it might be stacked up like this. So uh, click on your option. Find your cover crop like you normally would. Everything is a little bit more compact, but still works exactly the same. Um, we really designed this to make it 
but it's full. It, I mean, it is entirely full featured as the same as the desktop version. Um, yeah, so you have uh, as much fun with this as you would normally do for the um, the desktop version. Any other questions about this or about the mobile version? Any other things you'd like to see? Could you click on one of the sheets to see how they go? Uh, I'm sorry, one more time. It was a little hard to hear you. Uh, could you open a data sheet to see how that works? Oh, sure. So that's a, it's a, also kind of brings up a good point. So if you click on any of these, it'll have a pop-up for you to click on the data sheet. So learn more about Sunflower, you can click here. And again, it just stacks up nicely and would be very easy to read on a cell phone. So everything's exactly the same, just reoriented to work for your mobile platform. So yeah. We had another question come in. Um, will the sure. collector tool be updated for vegetables and will other states with different latitude be added? Um, so one of our next projects is to um, update the vegetable crop decision tool. Um, so that's, that is next on the list. We have a few states that are just about ready for that. Um, and then as far as other states with different latitude, um, these 12 states and Ontario is all that the Midwest covers. Um, but I do know that the Northeast Cover Crops Council and the Southern Cover Crops Council are working on um, a tool similar to this. Um, and we're, we're sharing information back and forth um, to help support them. Um, so other states uh, will be available, but just through a, a different um, comparable organization. And then we got another question about Glenn. You want me to take that one? Sure, go Dean. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that, so basically for this initial tool, we just have shown some typical blends, typical mixes for each state, just so that people understand that, that that's possible to mix cover crops. We are in the process of working on another online tool that um, would assist you in creating a blend. And so it would allow you and the, the, ultimate, the ultimate goal is that it would interface off of this tool um, that's uh, be something down the road that, that we're working on. Um, but that tool will allow you to create a blend, give you direction on some of the things that you're talking about um, as far as, as um, helping calculate the seeding rates, um, if there's, um, problems with species um, being together, um, that would be um, part of what that tool would tell you that um, a species aren't compatible with each other. Um, so that, that's in the works. Um, I can't give you any kind of a time frame at this point on it, but we are currently working on that tool. And then ultimately the idea would be to to put the two together so that they work work in conjunction where say you could start with this decision tool and check the ones that you would like to put into a mix and then hit the mix button and it would take those species to the mix calculator so that you could continue the process there. That That is kind of our ultimate vision on that. Any other questions? Pretty quiet. 
quiet out there. Um, we are very <laughs> excited to have this new tool. Um, like Ian was showing you, um, it's much easier to make corrections if there ha happens to be a typo or um, a state team wants to change or adjust some information for a certain cover crop. Um, and so please, if you find um, a typo or something's not working correctly, please reach out and let us know. Um, we are really appreciative to Bobic and Ian and the uh, Michigan State Lab for all their help on this tool. Um, I think they did a great job and um, we're, we're just so excited about this. It has been a, a long time coming and um, hopefully we'll get uh, additional updates and new tools out to you as quick as possible. Dean, Ian, or Bobic, is there anything that we've missed? Anything you want to go over? Uh, it's been great working with everyone here. It's been a great project, and I'm happy to have worked on it. No, I just yeah. reemphasize. I think um, the lab at MSU did a, did a great job. Um, they brought a lot brought a lot to the party with their knowledge of creating interfaces and, and how to make a lot of this stuff work. We gave them, we gave them some challenges, but they uh, definitely uh, rose to the occasion and, and met everything that met everything that we gave them. So I just want to <laughs> thank uh, Ian and Bobby for, for all your hard work and, and the, the great job that uh, you did on, on the tool as well as the interface for uh, modifying it in the future. And, and those types of things and just so everybody knows we're already planning our next next things to be working on with with these guys and hopefully we'll be bringing you some uh, additional resources in the future that come out of the, of the decision support lab okay. it's, uh, just And I think we, we covered everything here. Just uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Dean to give us this opportunity to work in these tools. And uh, I, I'm looking for future uh, actually co collaboration on the on this kind of tools. Thanks. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks everyone for joining. Make sure and check out our website, uh, join our listserv, follow us on Facebook and Twitter and stay connected.